schedule than most. And yeah, I like it. Yeah. So I teach two classes a semester. So that's the typical way. So usually there's two weeks, to, two days a week I have a class. And two days a week I can do other things. Fewer days I have to work. Just a lot of flexibility for me. Go out on the boat all day and go sailing, or we can have a lab in the morning to go make the title. And so it's just really nice to kind of mix it up. No, I tried so yesterday finishing the tag uh, project that I'm doing. I was in the water diving yesterday, but then had to also back to CSUP for an afternoon lab, and then teaching six to eight. And I was like, oh man, this, <laughs> I can see, this is not, you know, yeah. I was just, yeah. I'm yeah. learning what I do, so I don't like how I have to work it out. It is, I mean, it, it's all good. I'm glad I'm you know, getting to the classes. I, I need to do it to basically pay the bills and stay here for an year for myself. So. <laughs> Right, everyone. Thanks for coming to seminar today, and thanks to the Theology Lab for providing food. And I hear there's also a happy hour afterwards. Is that true? So stay afterwards, hang out with the seminar speaker, have some beers, have more food. All right. So I'm really pleased to introduce our, our speaker today, Dr. Jody Beers. Uh, Jody is currently an instructor, and she's a lecturer at CSU Monterey Bay, she's teaching five classes this semester. So trying to survive that, <laughs> and. It, as well, she's a research scientist at the Hopkins uh, Marine Lab, and she's been there for what is it, four, oh, five, years five years. Now? Five years now, and so for their series of postdoctoral positions with George Somro there, and with Jeremy Bolbogen, who was uh, one of the seminar speakers we had earlier in the semester with the, one of the cameras on the whales, all that cool stuff. Uh, so a little bit about Jody's background: she got her bachelor's degree from East Stroudsburg University, Pennsylvania, and then she went to correct. Yep, you yeah, got and then she went to the University of Maine. Uh, where she did her master's and her PhD, and she, most of her PhD research was down in Antarctica, so she spent three to four field seasons down there working on the ice fishes and really studying their physiology and their thermal tolerance, and so a lot of her research interest is really looking at sort of comparative animal physiology and really trying to understand uh, how stresses in the environment affect the adaptations and the physiology uh, of those species, so she's worked on those ice fishes, as I mentioned. Uh, she's done a lot of work with rockfish, which I think is part of some of the stuff she'll tell us today, looking at climate change, ocean acidification, and hypoxia, how it affects rockfish. She's worked on mudsuckers and estuarine habitats, so salinity stress and, and thermal stress. She's even worked on non-fish species, so she's worked on mussels in the intertidal, so as well thermal stress, desiccation stress, and really trying to understand both at the organismal level and down at sort of the molecular physiological level, you know, what's happening and how do those, those animals really uh, adapt and respond to those environments. And so, yeah, really excited to have Jody today. So her title is An Integrative Approach to Studying Fish Physiology in the Anthropocene. So okay. thanks, Jody. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Thank you, Scott. It's my pleasure to be here. I was saying when I, I came in the doors, I've been here for a little over five years now, and this is actually my first time uh, setting foot at Moss Landing Marine Labs. I'm hesitant to even say that because it should be embarrassing at this point for anyone interested in marine science and been here so long. All right, so by the introduction, uh, you've already picked up. I've worked on a lot of different organisms in a lot of different types of systems already. Uh, the talk that I'm going to give you today, yes, is a very fish-centric talk. So even though I've worked with middleless mussels and have enjoyed the work, I am definitely a fish head and coming from that kind of perspective, from my, my early days as an undergrad studying Salmonid uh, species to what I'm doing now with uh, rockfishes, which I'm going to tell you about. So this is going to be, uh, for, for some of you, it's definitely going to go in a little bit into the physiology, and I know you're coming from different backgrounds here. Um, but I'm going to give you a pretty broad perspective in how I take an integrative approach to the work that I do across a lot of different uh, levels of organization. All right, so here we go. And those of you that have been to Hopkins Marine Station, this probably looks uh, pretty familiar to you. Uh, the rocks, for obvious reasons, called bird rocks. And the reason I point this out is we're going to come full circle back to this image by the end of the talk. 
All right. So I've broken down what I'd like to discuss into three main areas. One, we'll start with just a little bit of an introduction to what I really mean by integrative physiology, why I call myself an integrative physiologist, and what exactly are we talking about with the Anthropocene. And that will kind of be the beginning going into talking about my early interests and how I got started and becoming enamored with looking at the environmental effects on the physiology and the function of marine organisms. We'll talk about two different systems. So the polar waters with the Antarctic fishes that I worked with and the effects of temperature predominantly. And then I'm going to segue into nearshore kelp forests here locally and the work I've done with Monterey Bay and Pacific rock fishes in regard to dissolved oxygen stress, temperature stress, and others. And then finally, I'm going to spend the last few minutes really talking about work that's still in progress. I'm actually finishing it up right now, but I'm really excited about, and it's sort of my vision for the future and where I see integrative physiology and the work that I do playing a role in the coming years. All right, so integrative physiology. We have all different types of definitions uh, for what this might be, but my definition is going to mean coming across from different sub-disciplines within physiology. I dabble in all of these areas that you see here, but predominantly uh, I take a comparative approach to my work, and then obviously I also look at the effect environmentally and how that impacts animal function. But again, I've kind of crossed paths within all these areas of physiology. I'm also going to refer to it as kind of this um, way that you go across a biological hierarchy. So in other words, I like to look at all different levels of organization, uh, the way the, the function is manifesting, and that's from basically molecules, the level of DNA, RNA, all the way up to the tissue, the whole organism, and then even beyond that. So now we're talking, once we get to populations and communities, it means looking at other factors such as the ecology and the behavior of animals. And I've been very big in multidisciplinary approaches and collaborating with several local colleagues to be able to achieve this kind of breadth of work, basically. All right, I, hopefully I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here, but we're going to state it anyway. The Anthropocene is basically the, our new catchy coin term for the effect of man basically on our environment. And this is the first time in the history of all geologic time that we have a human imprint on the geological, call it epics. Okay, we know that we have carbon emissions into the atmosphere, agricultural runoff, uh, just all kinds of disturbances. I won't go through all the list of how man has been impacting our environment in different ways. So much that we see these local headlines, whether it's a nature or global change, the human epic, okay, the geology of humanity. Okay, so we're making significant changes with our environment, and this has really happened in about the last 50 to 60 year time period. All right, so I'd like to take that sort of backdrop setting of the environment to my early interest in how I specifically got interested in looking at the physiological effects on animals by their environment. So as Scott already said, I did my graduate school work at the University of Maine, far northeast corner of our country, and I had the opportunity to go to the Antarctic Peninsula area uh, many different times throughout the six years of my graduate school in which I studied uh, Antarctic fish. Okay, but first, kind of just to set the stage uh, in terms of the environment, we're dealing with the Southern Ocean. So this is a, a system that obviously very, very cold, one of the coldest places on the planet. But I want to note a couple of different things. One, we have an Antarctic circumpolar current that runs clockwise around the, the, the entire continent that basically full, forms this really kind of massive amount of water isolating Antarctica from all the other warmer waters to the north of it. You can think of it kind of as a wall, okay? It's one of the most voluminous flows of anywhere on our planet with this current. So it's significant in basically keeping the Antarctic fauna within that region. Present day, we have very well oxygenated and thermally stable waters there. 
typically hovering around the, the freezing point of seawater, minus 1.9 degrees Celsius, can go up to a balmy 1.5 to 2 degrees. Uh, if you're up on the peninsula, that would be in the summertime. Uh, but generally, very cold, very stable. Okay, so I'd like you to keep that in mind. And the other thing that goes with cold temperature is going to be a high oxygen concentration. Okay, so remember, oxygen solubility is going to be inversely proportionate to temperature. So we have the highest oxygen content of, of anywhere. All right, so specifically, the Western Antarctic Peninsula, that's where Palmer Station is, that's where I did my work. Um, obviously, it's, it's breathtakingly beautiful, the glaciers, uh, you have the marine life, everything right there. But one of the, unfortunately, significant things about the peninsula region itself is that it's a hot spot of rapid climatic warming, one of the, the most rapidly warming on the planet. These are uh, a temperature data set for since 1950. These were atmospheric temperatures taken at the British base, uh, Faraday Vernadsky, during the winter. And the thing to know out of these data is that it's warming at 5.4 times the global average of anywhere else. Okay, so this is significant for animals that are used to a very, very constant, thermally stable environment. We've known for, for quite some time, actually, that the animals there are very sensitive to any changes or disturbances having to do with temperature. That includes all of the Antarctic fauna, which this big sea spider, other stars, you name it, but specifically the Antarctic notothenioids. So that's the group I'm going to spend my time talking about here a little bit more. We know that they die a heat death above four to five degrees Celsius, and we can classify them as really extreme stenotherms. So stenotherm meaning only tolerating a very narrow temperature range for these animals. Okay, and this was work uh, done by George Somero and Art DeVries. This was back when they were both Stanford uh, graduate students themselves um, that was published in, in science in the later part of the 60s. All right, so the group, this is a suborder. Of, of fishes called the notothenioids again. Uh, we sometimes refer to them as the Darwin's finches of the Southern Ocean. And we say this because similar to Darwin's finches, they have radiated to fill all these different really interesting niches within the environment. They did so very fast. And basically, they're one of the predominant fish species in the Southern Ocean, okay? They comprise most of the fish biomass in the area. And you get all different types, uh, whoops from the, the big Antarctic toothfish, which is commercially overexploited now with the fishing pressures, to this species, which is the Antarctic ice fish, I'm going to talk more about, to this guy, which is one of my favorites, it's called a dragonfish. If you look at the upturned jaw with the teeth protruding up, it's a kind of a lion weight predator. <laughs> All right, so that brings me just uh, the, the work that I specifically did in Antarctica, looking at the responses to temperature stress alone. And again, this is an ice fish, the common name blackfin ice fish, scientific name Kinocephalus oceratus, and you'll see that again in just a moment. Okay, so the, the Antarctic ice fishes are unique in that they're the only adult vertebrate animals that do not have hemoglobin in their blood. Okay, so we, we know that we, in our red blood cells, it, well, number one, it's red, and its principal function is to carry oxygen within the blood. Okay, but these guys are the only ones that do not have it. Okay, so complete absence of hemoglobin within the blood. And this is what it looks like. So you cut one open for the first time doing a dissection and you see this really opaque, clear, white, translucent looking blood. It just doesn't look natural because everything we know about vertebrate animals is you bleed red. <laughs> okay. All right, so this is bringing me to a number of other different adaptations that they have. And what you're looking at right now is their vascular system. This is on the retina of the eye, the cornea of the lens, everything has been removed. These are vascular perfusions that were done. And it basically allows, after you cut everything away, to see this demonstration of the blood vessels. What I want you to notice is, if you start on the left, we have an animal that's completely red-blooded with a 38% hematocrit, okay? So lots of hemoglobin. As we move over to 28% hematocrit, we see, ah, less vessels. By the time we get to the ice fish species with 0%, you just explosion of blood vessels. That can be characteristic of their, their entire vascular 
uh, system in which we see that this loss of the hemoglobin basically has modified their cardio, cardiovascular system, okay? There's a number of different adaptations, um, another one of which you see very large hearts. So here you're looking at three hearts from similar size animals now. The one on the left, this is the ventricle, okay, is the part of the heart. Light coloration, kind of pale pink looking, that's from the ice fish. The one all the way on the left, that's the full-blooded 37, 38% fish, okay, that has the hemoglobin in the blood. And you see just draconian modifications of the heart. We see it with blood volume. We see it in other areas as well. The basic goal for these animals, for the ice fish, is to modify your plumbing so that you can have more blood, get it around, for, so that the little bit of oxygen that's being carried in solution can make its way to the tissues. So it's a supply and demand issue, okay? So we're able to do it, but I'm gonna venture out and say, what does that set you up then though? If it's an oxygen supply and demand, you're able to do it with this kind of modified system. What happens if you start to change your environmental parameters? If you start to warm the water, you're going to have less oxygen available for the animals, okay? Remember the oxygen solubility is going to go down. It's going to be more challenging for these animals as temperature goes up to continue to get enough oxygen, okay? Because they're kind of on the precipice right now. So I was specifically interested in just looking at the ice fishes and how has this predisposed uh, them to conditions of warming when they're working with such a modified system to begin with that is on a threshold, basically. Okay, so I did a, an acute thermal stress called the, the critical thermal maximum and ramped them up over a, a period of time. You're looking at data from three red-blooded species and two ice fish species, so the two ice fish species here, and varying levels of hematocrit for the, the red-blooded species. And it's pretty clear we have a, a, a really good correlation uh, that hemoglobin level is correlating with the thermal tolerance. So what this is telling us then is that e these animals definitely are going to be more sensitive by far than their red-blooded counterparts uh, to the, the thermal warming or any little increases within the region. Okay, so basically that sets them up in a, in a warming world. You can't get back the deletion of hemoglobin, okay? It's gone. It's gone from your toolkit. Um, you're going to have to figure out how to meet the demands of getting enough oxygen. For these animals, it's going to be very difficult in a warming world. They can't migrate to colder waters. Okay, so I would venture that we always see the poster child for the, the Arctic, of course, but for the Antarctic, this would be my argument. They're a very sensitive species, and um, it's in terms of the future, we don't know yet if they can keep up. All right, so that's it with the, the interlude through the Antarctic. Uh, obviously, this was a fascinating place to work. There's a lot more that goes with this, and happy to talk to anyone if you want to know more about this after at the happy hour. Uh, but this is really what set me up, and I became just fascinated with learning more about how the environmental factors, particularly abiotic stressors such as dissolved oxygen, temperature, et cetera, affect animals. And it's with that context that that brought me back to the Northern Hemisphere, this time to Hopkins Marine Station where I did my postdoc wor work with George Somero and then some uh, more current work with Jeremy Goldbogen who was here recently um, to work in our local um, area. So most of you are well familiar with this, but we're talking about the California current large marine ecosystem, okay? Stretching from below Baja, California, all the way up the coastline into Washington. And we're going to be talking about this natural system that has upwelling events occurring regularly during the spring and into the summer, bringing cold, acidic, and low oxygen water into our nearshore environment. So very different in contrast from the Antarctic, okay? Going from one that's very stable with all abiotic factors across the board to now one that is a system characterized by a lot of variability for the animals that live there. All right, so I've done a lot of different work on different species within the area, but the one group I've become enamored with is the Pacific rock fishes. And I think probably similar to uh, the Antarctic fishes, it's a very speciose group. There's over 100 different species within the Sebastidae family itself. You get all different types. So this led me to look at uh, one factor first, which is the effects of dissolved oxygen on how they're, they're functioning. 
Okay, and this kind of, I, I love this illustration because it reminds me of something out of a Dr. Seuss book with the one fish, two fish, red fish. Blue fish was, was a childhood favorite, so it's no surprise I like fish. Um, but again, very highly prolific group, a lot of different habitat niches that they occupy, different depths, different environments, etc. And additionally, it's very important commercially and to our recreational fishery. Okay. So a couple of specific questions that I've been working on recently. These are kind of in a very broad context. Um, so I really became interested in looking at what the responses of these animals are to levels that aren't off you know, 50, 100 year scenarios, but what are the levels that they could be experiencing now at the lower end of the range that we know of? Okay, so let's max them out to what they can see ecologically now and see what kind of changes that that they're compensating with. Okay, so then also I was interested in, there's so many species as you've just seen, what's the differences between some of these species? Are there interspecific inter differences with the hypoxia tolerance? And then finally, how about age? So if we take just one species and look at it intraspecifically, what does that mean from these little recruits that come in that I'm going to talk about more until they reach adulthood? Does that change over time? All right, so study approach. So rock fishes, basically, they spawn out at sea, pelagic. They have the larvae. The larvae basically come into the near shore environment, such as our kelp forest habitats, where they recruit as juveniles. Um, and then many of the species come off the shelf as adults and go to deeper waters. Others, there are species as adults that they also stay local and resident, and I'm going to be talking more about one of those. I was interested in two different groups, the young of the year, which are the, the larvae that settle immediately. That's their first time on the near shore kelp forest. And then also one year uh, later to see how they've developed and what they've done over that, that past year. And again, I use a multi-level inquiry. Basically, we're going to have the whole organismal approach all the way down to cellular. You're going to get a snippet of what I'm going to share with you at a couple of these different levels. So again, this is another area. Happy to talk with anyone later if there's certain um, facets of it that you'd like to know more about. Oops, okay. All right, so here was the, the experimental protocol that we went with. And we based this on data that we know that here within Monterey Bay, there's a diel cycling that usually occurs, and there's a covariation that we see over the diel cycle with uh, pH, dissolved oxygen, and temperature that occurs. The low end of the range for the dissolved oxygen oftentimes goes down to as low as three milligrams per liter, and on occasion you can actually reach a two milligrams per liter, which can at times for certain species be actually lethal. Okay, so this was a ramp over about a six hour time period where it was taken down at constant stepwise intervals and then held at that potentially lethal level that they can see for a period of time. All right, here's the cast of characters in terms of the different species. This was opportunistic. It would, depended on what kind of recruits we got <laughs> uh, on, on this particular season. This was uh, almost two years ago now. Uh, so we have some more active, kind of predatory type of fish in Boccaccio and chili pepper. We have olive and yellowtail, which you can see actually some of them stay put in the, the kelp forest as adults as they get bigger, related with the kelp forest, uh, with the, both the canopy and within the, the water column. And then this, the blue rockfish, which kind of became our lab rat, so to speak, and I'm going to give you most of the talk um, on that particular species. All right, so we're going to start at the whole organismal level and talk about a little bit with metabolism, so some of the energetics. And we did this using an intermittent flow respirometry system. We also monitored with video to look at ventilation rates uh, in addition to that. Uh, before I'll start, one of my undergraduate students who's from CSUMB, Patrick Carilli, has worked with me for a couple of years, and he was instrumental in helping collect a lot of the data with the respirometry and just kind of as left hand. Uh, man, so to speak, with this. All right, I'm going to take you through this particular graph. You're going to see a couple more of these for the other species, but I'm only going to, I'm going to break down this one, and then we'll look at the other data. So on the top is the ventilation, and that's in opercular beats per minute. So you're looking at the, the operculum going back and forth, basically, on the video. 
and then the bottom figure is going to be the standard metabolic rate. Now that's the metabolism of an animal that's basically at rest. It's going to be post-absorptive, you know, fasting conditions. All right, so let's start with the top, okay? If we look at the dissolved oxygen level as it decreases, so reading from right to left, we notice that the first significant change in the ventilation occurs around three milligrams per liter, okay? So that's saying that that's different from the pretty much normoxic or um, ambient type of levels up over six milligrams per liter, okay? In terms of the metabolic rate, we also see a change occurring at three milligrams per liter. So similar in the response, both behaviorally with that mechanism and then also as a whole for the metabolism. All right, so now let's take a look at the other species that we, that we sampled and see how it compares. Okay, so there's your blue rockfish for reference. The Boccaccio, so this one's next. And we're gonna go through these somewhat quickly now, but just want you to look at where the significant changes occur. So four milligrams per liter for the ventilation, three milligrams per liter for the, the standard metabolic rate. Okay, and we're looking at similarities and differences here across species, so please keep that, bear that in mind. Next, the chili pepper. So we did not see a behavioral modification in ventilation until lower levels of, of DO, so at, at two milligrams per liter, and we did not detect any change in the metabolic rate across all the, the dissolved oxygen concentrations we tested. The yellow tail. Ventilation, three milligrams per liter, and then metabolic rate, we saw a change and it occurred at the lowest level that we t tested, 1.5 milligrams per liter in that case. Okay, and then finally, the olive rockfish, and we see a very similar pattern to that of the yellowtail, actually really, really close in terms of both the significant changes and the overall trend of, of the responses. All right, so number one, I think we can conclude, yes, they're not all the same, that's for sure. Uh, there are interspecific differences, at least in these two parameters of function and how they're responding. Uh, the ventilation is about a 32 to 38% change between the different species. And then the standard metabolic rate, we see a decrease in that from 14 to 55%. So a lot more variation amongst the species when we consider the metabolic rate. Okay, rather than just the ventilation. We could go so far as to kind of group these by the responses, and we would say that the, the lowest tolerance would be the blue and the Boccaccio. Uh, intermediate tolerance probably for the yellowtail and the olive based on that, and then the chili pepper, which doesn't seem to do anything across all the DO levels with the me metabolism, uh, probably confers some of the higher tolerance levels to hypoxia. All right, so with that, we're gonna segue from the interspecies comparisons, and I wanna specifically now go to the blue rockfish. So there's a number of reasons why this animal was really good to look, uh, look at some of these things with, and I'm gonna kinda tear it down as we go across. For those of you that dive around here, obviously we don't often see this kind of pristine <laughs> picture for a kelp forest. And for anyone that's been in the water this fall, this is far cry from what we see right now. But this is gorgeous photography, and that is a school of adult blue rockfish, and that is characteristic of our local kelp forests. They do school, and you see massive numbers kind of bunched up like that. All right, so now we're going to look at the age-dependent uh, uh, responses. And here's the same ventilation graph. Uh, what you're looking at now is going to be the young of year, so the newly settled, and the one-year-old age class. Okay, so young of year in the red, and the older animals are in the blue. First thing that should be apparent, absolute rates across the board are much higher for the young of year, younger fish, than it is for the older fish. Okay, the second thing that you'll notice then is in terms of the significant changes, it seems that it takes longer for the one-year-olds to have that sort of compensatory response where they increase the ventilation to get more oxygen. All right, so we would say then that the ventilation threshold for the young of year is going to be higher than the one-year-old blues. All right, how about metabolic rates? What does that look like between the two age classes? Let's start on the left, 
and we're looking at the young of the year blues and then one year olds on the right and you're seeing kind of a profile first thing that should stick out is we have a little bit more going on here in terms of the overall pattern I want you to note the axes are the same so at the higher end 140 milligrams of oxygen uh, mass specific all right we can look at the standard metabolic rate again and this is going to be again the animal at rest so these points are not significantly different from one another as you go through the data on each drop okay however the young of year blues are about 30 percent greater in terms of their absolute costs we can then look at and define what we call the critical oxygen threshold or p crit for short and you determine that through a type of analysis, basically, which involves some multiple, multiple linear regressions. It's a little more complex than what I will go into here. This is a first cut analysis of what we've been doing with these data. Um, but basically, if you have a higher P crit value, okay, that means that you're going to be more sensitive to the hypoxia, okay? That critical level is happening sooner. And what we see is that is indeed the case for uh, the young of the year blues compared to the one year olds. Okay, so they're more sensitive to hypoxia is what it looks like it's showing. All right, we're going to go from the whole organismal now uh, to another level of analyses. And I guess another thing I'm enamored with is doing blood work. So from the Antarctic fish blood now to other parameters that I like to measure, we're looking at lactate and glucose in the blood plasma. And these are great indicators of metabolic state. Okay, if we look on the left, so the plasma lactate, uh, we have the solid bars are going to be under normoxic conditions, so full ambient dissolved oxygen, and then hypoxia at that two milligram per liter mark. And it goes up for both young of year and the one year old blues in each uh, situation, but it's not significantly different. So the trend is there, but no significant difference. However, glucose, we do see that there's an upregulation in the young of year, which would indicate a utilization of their energy stores. Okay, so they're seeing that whereas the one-year-old um, blues are not so does indicate again a difference with the young of the year compared to the older cohort all right we extended this work uh, to a cellular level analyses now and again this is going to be with the blood uh, using a flow cytometry technique one of the greatest things that uh, this confers for the study system Young of year rockfish are very tiny. I mean, you're looking at, you know, not a very big fish. You can imagine it's very difficult to get blood from them, as I'm sure Scott will tell you, and we all know. Uh, you can use flow cytometry. You only need a couple of microliters, one to two microliters. I can do the full analyses this way and look at different parameters of stress. So I did this with my colleague over at Hopkins, Dr. Benjamin Rosenthal, who is a comparative immunologist and is interested in health status. So I um, kind of teamed up with him, and we use this method that's called FACS for short, but really it's a fluorescent activated cell sorting technique specifically. So you're using antibodies and you're tagging things within the blood that you can see fluorescently. Two of these, propidium iodide PI, is an indicator of cell viability. That tells us how healthy these cells still are, how stressed are they. We also look for reactive oxygen species. Okay, so indicator of oxidative stress, which are responses that you typically can get in response to temperature, low dissolved oxygen, any of these types of environmental stressors. Why is this important? Oxidative stress can do a lot of damage to your different macromolecules. Uh, you can have DNA damage, you can have uh, damage to your proteins, protein carbonylation, lipid peroxidation. So it's, it's very important within tissues and cells. All right, so the, the graph is basically just a representative output where we can look at and analyze. This is the normal population. The propidium iodide is showing us basically that those are dead cells. And then the oxidative stress cells are another population that is skewed on the graph. All right. So if we look at then the results of this particular analysis, and this is just one of two of the parameters that we were looking at, this was a blood analysis for a one-year-old blues and you're looking at on the left hand graph the total cell population so basically all of the blood and normoxic on the left hypoxic on the right and this is the for a reactive oxygen species the fluorescence 
So much higher, significantly so, for the hypoxic condition. Okay, so indicating much more oxidative stress uh, for those animals. And then on the right, we just narrowed it down where we're only looking at white cells within the blood, and we saw the same response again. Okay, so this example basically shows we've been talking, uh, we don't have the young of year here, but we have the one-year-old. So you do, at a different level of organization now, we're seeing a different stress, uh, you know, that is apparent. We didn't see it with the plasma, lactate, and glucose, but at this level, this animal, now we're seeing something else with the oxidative stress. Okay. So the, the white cell uh, population, that also suggests to us that in terms of oxidative stress, these are phagocytic cells, okay? So that means, you know, they're clearing up the debris and cells that have already been, you know, <coughs> gone through the process of, of not doing so well here, basically. <laughs> All right, so let's summarize this part. Uh, we can see rockfishes under these sublethal kind of conditions that we're testing upon at this lower end environmentally. Uh, they certainly are showing that there are costs, energetic costs associated with those levels that we're exposing them to. We're seeing species-specific differences uh, across the different ones that we tested. We're also seeing age-dependent uh, mechanisms that are being utilized, whether it's just a behavioral modification alone with ventilation, whether it's um, changing the metabolic rate or other, other means. And then finally, uh, we would conclude that it does d uh, seem like the young of year or the younger cohort are going to be more sensitive, and it doesn't even take that much time. One year later, it starts to confer a little bit better tolerance to the situation. All right, so with that, I'm going to now finish up on the last part that I'm really excited about, and that's what I'm gonna call bridging gaps now. So one thing you'll notice, I, I talked about um, Stressors, basically, in singular context, number one, we all know there's multiple stressors and we need to be thinking about how these are working together. Even here in the Bay, I mentioned co-variation of pH, dissolved oxygen, and temperature. So that's the first thing. We have to expand here to start thinking more broadly in, in multiple stressors and not even just the multiple abiotic stressors, but I would argue biotic stressors, predator-prey relationships, natural context, food availability, et cetera. What we see in the laboratory, okay, is not always indicative of what we're going to see out there in the field by a long stretch, especially when we're learning just from single mechanisms. So why do it? Well, we learn mechanistically what they do. You have to start from the ground up, but environmental change today is happening so fast, and it is happening right in front of our eyes. We need to come up with approaches how we can more bridge the gap of what we're seeing so we can see physiology, see animal function, and how it's actually happening in the field with all these other variables at play at the same time. No small task, okay? We've done, there's been a lot of great uh, studies that have been done historically, but really piecing it all together has been hard to do. Technology is getting better, okay? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now with some of the different approaches we can use. Uh, namely, the first one is going to be biologging. So this was a project I got involved with the Stanford uh, Woods Institute for the Environment in just the, the last about year and a half or so. And I teamed up with, with uh, Dr. Jeremy Goldbogen, so you guys heard him for all of his whale work. When he came to Hopkins, I twisted his arm and said, how about fish now? We're gonna go scale down in size a little bit. And he was very enthusiastic about doing the work with the biologging. All right, so we're looking at fish behavior and energetics in the lab, but then we're coupling it with the field with these approaches. And what I'm talking about is using acoustic tags sensors uh, that we can measure in the field. And yes, I realize, no, these are salmon. They are not the rockfish, but this was a really nice image to show you that the way we do it is through a series of different receivers, okay? Acoustic receivers that are set up to basically capture a signal sent, an individually coded signal by each fish that swims within the proximity, okay? These animals are I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but they each have coded transmitters is what you need to know, and then we get the signal. And yes, there's my blue rockfish. 
All right, so we, this is all happening at Hopkins at the Marine Station within our, our marine life refuge. Okay, so here's the back view of Bird Rock, basically, uh, and the kelp forest. These are, this is one of my undergraduates and then a, a volunteer, where we basically went out and we went to the site and we had to catch the blue rockfish, number one. Why did we do it locally? They have high site fidelity. That's one of the reasons they has made the blue rockfish a really good uh, choice for us to work with. We need the animal to stay put. It can't swim off with our $750 tags a pop. So we needed to stay within that array of receivers that you guys, uh, that I've just shown you. So we devised a couple of methods. Yes, we did the traditional fishing hook and line from the boat, but then we thought it would be a great idea to combine scuba with it. And we actually did underwater fishing hovering uh, so that we could identify not only the right species, but the size of the fish that we needed to accommodate the right size tag. So this was actually a lot of fun. It was a favorite, you can imagine, for the undergrads that helped participate with this part. Uh, although that is me there, so I got to have some fun too. Um, all right, in the lab then, here's what one of the, the tags look like. Whoops, go back. Uh, one of the tags, so not, not too big, but you have to accommodate the right size. We surgically implant this in the fish. So this is one uh, that's now been anesthetized. There's a, a slit in the peritoneal cavity. You insert the tag into the animal. You suture it back up. You have it recover in a, ta in a tank. You help it until it achieves keeping you know, steady equilibrium on its own. Um, and then you're pretty much good to go. We inserted two different types of tags. So the first set, we did six different animals with temperature and pressure tags. Okay, so basically we can get a depth profile on them and we can get also temperature readings in knowing where they're going out there within the kelp forest. Another type that we used was accelerometer tags. Okay, so we had two of these. We ended up inserting in four, a total of four different animals. But prior to releasing the animals to the refuge, we put them in a swim tunnel and we basically calibrated the, uh, the metabolism through a, a, a response of different levels um, that they were swimming at. Okay, so now we have the laboratory energetics. We're going to release them. We're going to be able to get the field energetics using this technique. Better yet, we have a lot of sensors out in the, in the water. So what you're looking at now is a aerial view, so now you've had front side, back side, and now top down a bird rock. This is the array itself, so every yellow push pin basically shows you where I have a receiver, okay, so to detect where the fish is going. And then the sensors, dissolved oxygen, temperature, and pH are at the three of the red stars across that array, and it's across a depth profile. Okay, so we have temperature and dissolved oxygen basically from the surface to the bottom. We also have the kelp forest array, which is a local um, way that we can actually in situ get live measurements that's always taking continuous reads of dissolved oxygen temperature, et cetera. Uh, and then my two colleagues I'd like to mention, Dr. Steve Litvin and then Dr. Mike Squibb. So one, a, a fisheries uh, kind of field ecologist, and then Mike Squibb, who is an environmental engineer, uh, has been instrumental in helping with the sensors themselves. Um, in terms of measuring uh, these parameters. All right, so now we have that overlay. So basically what we can do now, we can put all of this together and we're building a picture. So, and, and no, again, that's not my blue rockfish, but it, it works for this, this, this slide. So we're basically going to have some sort of trace of where this animal's been, what it has done now through the behavior. Okay, we're also going to have the energetics of what they're doing. And we have all of these different abiotic factors that we're measuring. So we can kind of start to put this on a map, if you will, knowing where they're going and what some of these levels are to a reasonable uh, kind of temporal and spatial scale. Okay, not fine, but pretty, pretty good. Better than what's traditionally been done. And then beyond this, there's actually sort of a, a, a bigger picture yet, believe it or not. Uh, we teamed with uh, a collaborator up at the communications department at, in Palo Alto at the main campus of Stanford, who is a whiz with virtual reality. So our plan is to actually, through educational outreach, take the live data we have, so the, the, 
the traces of the behavior in real time of these animals and hand it off to them and they will be creating virtual reality simulations where we can see what the fish are doing and how they're responding and more importantly if you're someone that has not you know ever been scuba diving you haven't personally been in a kelp forest yourself you can start to actually experience it a little bit more real time than others and yes yeah, so this is dr jeremy balanson he's the one we've been working with uh, yes this is a football scene that's stanford football team they work a lot with the nfl and college teams this is for those of you that like football that's roger goodell our nfl commissioner so this is a state-of-the-art system up on in jeremy's lab but what we're really doing is modifying the system where you can use the oculus headsets so that it's something easy for a couple hundred bucks it can be outreach in schools anywhere you want to basically play it and if we have our way then yes it's going to look more like this and the football is going to be turned off now see i actually i do kind of like football but i, I like this better <laughs> okay wrapping it up then final points and i guess what i'd like you if you take nothing else to remember from my talk I really believe integrative and collaborative approaches uh, today, especially with the immense challenges we're facing with environmental change, uh, they're going to be necessary. We have to team up. We can't all you know, do one given thing. Me as a physiologist, I've had help from ecologists, engineers, you name it, across the board. Okay, and I think that's going to really help us scale up. I haven't even mentioned uh, modelers and others that we need to be involved so that we can basically inform conservation and fisheries management uh, across the board. Next, uh, I really think it's important that we need to look at these sublethal levels. What's the, the, the stress that the animals are facing now? Because just because we don't end up with massive fish kills or other events that happen when you see it on, on, turned up on beaches doesn't mean they're not being affected. Uh, think of it as yourself, you know, sometimes until you might have things going on underneath the surface and you don't even know about it until you go get a blood test, so, oh, I have high cholesterol, something like that. You could be ticking time bombs, so I'm going to suggest that we need to be considering this now. Ecological context is the other part of it. We have to be able to put them out there because otherwise we can't predict where they're going, what they're doing. Uh, the geographic distribution changes that we're, we're seeing now with many, many different species and we're going to continue to see as we go forward in the coming years. And then finally, the last from the lab to the, the field. We don't want to lose sight of the mechanism that we learn in the lab, and indeed I have one foot stuck in mechanism for sure, but when it comes to the environmental changes, we definitely have to continue to kind of adapt with the technology. Uh, so my, my example with the biologging, you know, years ago we only had much larger animals that we could do some of the biologging. The technology is getting better. Now we have smaller tags that we can go down to smaller fish. I'm hoping before long we'll have a tag that we can actually put in a, a young of year, but although that might be a while yet, right? <laughs> so that's pretty little. Um, but this must need a shift. I really believe we, we need to know that now um, in terms of what we're facing. So it's, it's imperative for the, the interim. And with that, I have a lot of people to thank. Obviously, when you're talking collaborative work over time, there's many, many different names. Uh, first, my past collaborators, most notably, so I worked with Dr. Bruce Seidel for both my, my master's and my PhD at the University of Maine. He was a fantastic advisor, and if nothing else, uh, kind of infecting me with the polar passion, as we call it. Um, once you've been there, for many of us, you can't get enough. It's just a spectacular uh, place to work. My most current collaborator is certainly George Somero. So I went from having a great PhD advisor to having an equally spectacular postdoc advisor in George. I was really, really fortunate. Uh, Jeremy has brought me full circle. I actually did study whales as an undergrad in Hawaii where I was much a more a behavior enthusiast and it wasn't until I took my first physiology class as late in my undergrad that I became enamored with the physiology and I was no longer, as I put it, a whale hugger. So I've come full circle in working with Jeremy, and it's kind of fun that I brought him that we're working with fish. And he did work in, with some fish in the past, though, too. So I'll give him his credit. Uh, others I've already mentioned: Steve Litvin, Benjamin Rosenthal. Uh, also, I'd like to mention Dr. Cheryl Logan. So Cheryl and I have had a, a working relationship with students. My student Patrick Carilli, she sent him my way. We've had students going back and forth between Hopkins and, and CSUMB. Uh, and we've collaborated on both uh, Middleus work and then also more recently with some of our discussions of rockfish. 
facilities and field support, a lot of different people uh, for lab space and helping. Uh, particularly our dive program was great. Uh, and then student support. Two different graduate students have been involved in the, the, the various stages of the project. And then another two CSUMP students, Annette Verga Legier and Patrick Carilli, who have been instrumental in helping me with many different stages across that organization that I've talked about. So picking out a student, they've helped on discrete sections of what you see. Uh, lots of different funding, National Science Foundation, Woods Institute for the Environment, um, and then polar programs. Can't thank enough for the opportunities there as well. So I think that's about it. And with that, I think we have time for questions now. Uh, we did do it, we did a one way ANOVA on those to start. It looked like from the graph, I'm assuming the, the error bars were standard error, that there was a significant difference from the initial values to some level before it got to where it was significant. It just looked like. We did both one way ANOVA, that's what I showed you there, and then we also had played around with just looking between the different groups, like you said, with a, with a two-way. Uh, but we ended up staying with the, the one-way ANOVA, and that went back to basically the normoxic levels for that data set. And it was standard error. Yeah. Scott. So do you have a hypothesis for you know, why those different rockfish species have such different kind of hypoxia? Uh. Nope, good question. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'd really like to start looking more at the, some of the predator prey dynamics and what they're doing out there and sort of the microhabitat scale of where they are. We're tr trying to think is it where they are in the water column at any given time? Is it because they've kind of adapted? If it's bottom depth is, you know, lower pH, for, for instance, where that might be playing a role versus up in the water column, we, we know they're not necessarily bottom. But so thinking about sort of the spatio-temporal spatio scale that they're on, compared, comparatively speaking, but then also thinking what kind of dynamics are we talking? They're still small, so these were small ones, even the one-year-olds that we've seen. So what kind of pressures do they have from the older ones if it's a we still see relative, I mean, three-year-old Boccaccios, I, I would say, that, that we've seen out there. Speculation, I mean, we're looking, you know. Uh, so no, no solid answer yet, but I was thinking it's something to do with their, the natural history, the setting. So hence, trying to figure out more within the field, where they're going, what they're doing, and what other, what other variables are we not considering? Because I think there's more there than, than meets the eye. <laughs> So there has to be something else that they're doing that confers, you know, that there's trade-offs. There's always trade-offs. Um, is, is there some analysis that you think it was a naturally occurring genetic deletion of the hemoglobin, number one. No, I would not say there's necessarily advantage for them. Now, you can have lowering hemoglobin levels. We have it in fish species. You can see it seasonally where hematocrit levels change. So if you think about an animal going into the winter, um, for instance, if you're a temperate fish, uh, they usually lower their hematocrit, blood viscosity reason. So in that case, it would be advantageous to the fish to lower the, the viscosity of the blood. It's harder to pump if it's more viscous in the, in the colder water, right? Okay, so that's an example of being advantageous. These guys, they're not seeing difference. You don't have really any seasonal change in temperature that you, you can you know, account for. So the naturally occurring uh, deletion, we would argue, and it's pretty much uh, kind of the going hypothesis right now, is it's not lethal in this environment. So they've been able to, basically it's neutral. It's, it's been allowed to continue. In any other environment, that animal is not going to, it's not going to occur. We do have evidence to suggest looking at cardiac outputs uh, that it is not energetically favorable. 
they still get by and they're able to make, meet their needs. But for a white-blooded fish versus the red-blooded fish, the white-blooded fish has a significantly higher cardiac output energetic expense than the red-blooded of similar size. So again, they're kind of it, suggesting that they're on the threshold, anything to push them over. So I would argue it's neutrally occurring right now in terms of the mutation. The oxygen and how it affected the uh, reactive oxygen. Mm -hmm. Well, I noticed that it was a, a very small percentage of the cells that showed stress, you know, about 1%. Right. And would you have expected that, or would you have expected all the cells to show some stress? No, I think I'd, I'd expect a proportion. Of, of the cells. I mean, I think for sublethal conditions, I mean, you would really have to really ramp up the system in order to see a higher population of that. Does that mean that those cells are like the crummy cells? <laughs> um, and the other ones were fit? Well, for, I think for any, you could, I guess, look at it that way, but uh, for any given population, you're going to have some natural turnover that's going to occur. We have, even in a healthy individual, you have turnover of cells. You start to add more stress and you're going to have a higher and higher turnover. Well, I was just wondering yeah. what, because uh, you have to repl replenish the cells, you have to make them and then destroy right. them and make them and destroy them. And so right. some small percentage is turning over. Right. That's why I was asking. That. Yeah, but that, but that percentage that's turning over is going up. So that was an increase. So what you were looking at in just that one small kind of representative output was from a stressed individual compared to uh, the control. Yeah, and so the control kind of in fact shows that they're not only Right, exactly, yeah. I showed you one representative, probably could put it side by side so you can actually visually, qualitatively see the difference. But yes, it was indicative, so you don't see that shift in the way the cells kind of scattered on that out, fax output. And yeah. To, um, from start to end of the blood circulation cycle, mm -hmm. how high and low does the oxygen get inside that fish when it's from the beginning cycles through to its lowest oxygen, the oxygen's gone, what is right. that? What is that? So with venous supply, we have not actually measured internal, and most of it's because we're working with such tiny little fish. It would be very difficult to cannulate and to try to, to, to do that. You could do it in larger fish, absolutely. Uh, we have not done that with the adults. We just recently started working with the larger ones, which you could test that and know. Um, my basic assumption, like most vertebrate animals that we know of, as you come in, you're going to have a venous supply of oxygen that, is, of course, is gonna be much less than the incoming arteri arterial supply. But it would be good to know what the drop is and if, you know. <laughs> yeah. What's the lifespan of the uh, two different types, types of tags, the pressure temperature tags and the accelerometers? How long do they last? It depends on how you have them programmed. <laughs> so different timing intervals. We were trying to get as high as resolution as we reasonably could. There's a lot of different trade-offs in the programming. Uh, the ones that I'm using right now lasted from approximately June, and we had two that just died now. <laughs> uh, we're pulling the receivers, actually. I was in the water pulling some of them on Wednesday, so that study is ending, and we'll be able to interpret the data. Uh, up to about six months, roughly, with the ones I'm using right now, in, in, in short, but it just depends. That's set at a sampling interval of about 120 seconds, so you're collecting, you're getting that coded signal every 120 seconds is what we have it set at. There's trade-offs because of the different type of sensors involved with them because we do have the, the temperature and the, the depth, the pressure sensor within them. So you gotta consider that. The other thing to consider in such a small array, that's a, actually a pretty small array. With kelp forest uh, habitat we found, you, your spacing between your receivers could not be that broad. There's other studies where you can go you know, quite a few um, you know, up to, you know, measured in like 500 meters spacing between, depending what's in the way of the receivers. Here, no, it's, it's very small. You're, you're talking about 50 meters spacing between adjacent receivers to be able to properly uh, capture the, the, the signal. So tags can collide. So in other words, how many fish you have there if they're staying resident, if I have eight fish swimming around, you can, if you go too short of a time interval, you'll have colliding signals 
that basically you won't be able to get quite as good of, of, of resolution with it. So it, it's all those trade-offs, but long answer to your question, but if, the ones I have now, about six months, roughly. What, do you want me to shut this down or? Yeah, I will. Uh, okay. Cool. Well, thank you. No Great. problem. I told you it was broad. Explaining things clearly. Yeah, they could be very. You can tell I've had a lot of more undergrads right now, right? Can you tell I've been teaching that much right now? <laughs>